So this is joint work with Felipe Kucker that I'm going to tell you about. So my first transparency is just motivation. Actually, there's no need for motivation in this workshop. It's dedicated to uh, studying the uh, how to solve polynomial equations. That's, of course, a very fundamental problem, and we know it's an NP-hard problem. If you look at it over the field with two elements, it's NP-complete. It's also NP-complete if you look at it over the complex numbers in the bloom schupp smell model. And there has been a lot of work in symbolic computation. It has been studied in detail, not only practically, but also in terms of complexity. But uh, the problem is with all these methods, um, the running time somehow is exponential. So if you have, uh, like, if, like D is a, an upper bound on degree of the polynomials, and n is the number of variables, you always have this, this D to the n in the upper bound. So if you, for instance, if you have a system of quadratic equations, it will be something like 2 to the n. Okay, in all these symbolic methods. But the question is whether one can do better. <clears throat> Nowadays, there is this uh, field of numerical algebraic geometry that is growing. We have heard several talks about that in this workshop. And um, these, uh, these methods can go much f further. They can solve much bigger problems. Um, they perform better in practice. And the goal of my talk is I try to understand from the complexity point of view why this is the case. So I want to... That's the goal. And somehow hoping to, in the end, <laughs> well, it will require a lot of research, but at the moment there is a huge gap between what we can see in practice and what we can actually prove. And we try to narrow this gap. Okay. So it's always good to have some light tower or leading problem. <laughs> and there was a problem that was posed by Steve Smale uh, some time ago, and it reads as follows. Um, we have given is a system of co uh, complex polynomial equations n polynomials in n unknowns and we want to solve it, we want to compute a solution how difficult is that? and he asked can, it be, can such a solution be found approximately on the average in polynomial time by a uniform algorithm so these expressions, these words in blue at the moment are not precisely defined, I will go into define them later on, but this is the problem, yeah? It's a, we ask for polynomial time, we don't want to go away from these two to the n. Okay, and this uh, problem has its origin in a series of papers by, uh, written by Mike Schub and Steve Smale at the beginning of the 90s. They all have in the title complexity of Bezout theorem, and then it goes one, two, three, four, five, and then it stopped. And uh, okay, and they partly in their paper actually in Bezout five, this problem was partly solved, but not completely. So uh, okay, and then later on, uh, Beltran and Pardo took up this story again, and they had a very nice idea that I'm going, that I'm going to explain. And they came up with an answer, with a positive answer to the, this problem by Steve Smale. Positive when you allow randomized algorithms. Okay. So, and, okay, let me briefly uh, explain uh, uh, the work that I've done with Felipe. What are our contributions? Uh, so, in a sense, there are, there are okay, different results and uh, we enlarged kind of the toolbox. So one result was that we found a deterministic algorithm for Smale 17's problem, and it's almost polynomial time. So if n is the input size, and the polynomial is given in dense representation, capital N is the input size, meaning that number of coefficients, so it's not bit size, then the expected running time, well, okay, <laughs> expected. The algorithm is deterministic, but we average over the input space in a certain space mean, uh, I will explain you exactly what it means, then the average running time will be n to the O log log n. So it's almost polynomial. And actually what we prove a little bit more, if you restrict ourselves to systems of bounded degree, think of a system of quadratic polynomials, then it's actually the expected running time is polynomial. So in this case it will be n squared. Okay, so this was one result. The other result, uh, I don't understand that. Okay. So, D is 
So you have D okay. at degree fixed, right? Mm -hmm. Then it's polynomial. Right? Okay, there will be more details, but you see, okay, I'll wait. there will I'll be wait. more details. There will be, this is just overview, there will be more details. Okay. There will be more precise statements. So if you allow, be patient. Uh, good. This is just the overview. So let me briefly talk about this idea of smooth analysis. So we want to analyze algorithms. What, what traditionally has been done in computer science is the worst case, worst case, and sometimes average case, yeah? Especially when, when you have algorithms like the simplex algorithm where, where we know it works well in practice but there are bad inputs. They are very rare and hard to construct but still they exist. So we want to have a theoretical justification why the algorithm is good. So what people did, they did an average analysis. But the problem is the average analysis is not so convincing because the input is never follows these distributions. So well, there was this great idea by Dan Spielman and Shan Wang Teng, it's, uh, more than 10 years ago. They, they smoothed analysis. They said, well, pictorially, if you want, it's very easy to explain. So this is your, you have your input here, and then you assume that it has some noise. Okay. Maybe, maybe you model this by a Gaussian, that is, has a mean f bar and some variance sigma square. Okay, so you have, and then what you do if you have a, let's say t is the, is the running time of the algorithm that you are studying. So this is a function of your input f. And then what you do, you take the expectation over this noise. So, so it's a local expectation. And then you want to bound this, and you want to bound it over all centers f bar, you don't know, you don't care where this is. You want to bound this by a small quantity and if you can do that then you're happy. Of course this quantity will involve uh, this variant sigma and if sigma is very small then this will grow. Okay, so this is the idea of smooth analysis and what we managed to do, we managed uh, to perform a smooth analysis of uh, this algorithm this randomized algorithm that was proposed by Beltran Pardo. So we, we get smoothed expected running time. So this is the overview, but I, right. So, okay, this of course was a bit vague. Now, um, in order to state this precisely, I have to introduce notation. Okay, so this is an important slide and I will come back to it. Uh, it co contains uh, a lot of the definitions. <coughs> so let's go through it. Uh, so I fix some degree vector d, d1 up to dn, and this will define my input space, denoted this calligraphic d, hd. So it, what are the elements of hd? These are n tuples of polynomials, of homogeneous polynomials. f is f1 up to fn, and fi is a homogeneous polynomial of degree di in n plus 1 variables. Okay, so I, the input size is just a dimension, the complex dimension of this vector space. So yeah, no? What is the output space? It's comple complex projective space. So I would should say, uh, well, we want to, in the end, we will want to analyze an algorithm. So we want to make use of the geometry of the problem. So everybody in algebraic geometry agrees that complex uh, projective space is the nicest space you can think of. That's why we look at projective situation of a uh, affine situation. So everything is homogenized. And the output space is complex projective space. So we look for a zero in this space of the given f. Okay. Then we need to measure distances. So we have a, a metric on the complex projective space, which is, think of it as terms of an angle. It comes from the so-called Fubini Studi metric. That's not so important. <coughs> think of projective space as something like a sphere. And we, we are measuring angular distance. I denote it by D. Also, I have to measure distances between inputs because I want to talk about condition. I want to say what happens if I have an input F and I perturb it a little bit. So, and, uh, now it's important to, to choose the right distance measure. So what I do, and well, what I do, what uh, and Smale have done all the time, they choose an inner product on 
the input space HD that is invariant under the action of the unitary group. So we have a symmetry here. We can have an orthogonal transformation yeah, the, on, my, on the input space in the natural way. And of course, this induces a, a orthogonal unitary, I wanted to say. Of course, this um, defines a transformation, an operation of the unitary group on this space. Yeah. Okay. And there is not much choice here. Uh, so we, ch we choose one of these uh, Hermitian inner products. Let's call it the while inner product. And once I have this, I can talk about the norm of an input and about angles. Okay, about angles. So I have this notion of angular distance. Okay, good. And then uh, last notion on this slide. This is uh, what we call the solution variety. So it's an incidence variety. It consists of all pairs f and zeta. f is an input, it's an element of HD. Zeta is a zero. Okay, so this is a subset of this algebraic variety. One can prove it's a manifold. So I think it's important here to understand that, okay, <laughs> it's a design question. What should the input space uh, be? Now, if you see, if I have this f here and I multiply f by 100, what will change? Nothing. I mean, the zeros will be the same. So one could say, maybe the input space should rather be the projective space uh, uh, that belongs to HD. Okay, I could do that. I could also scale this F1 up to Fn individually. This is another possibility. I don't do it here. So, okay. But for some reason, and for our techniques, it will be very important that you also have this notion of norm even though it doesn't have a meaning for the problem. It doesn't have a meaning for the problem directly, but it will be very important uh, in the analysis. Okay. So why is, why is this solution variety smooth? It is. It's a fiber bundle in this direction. Thank you, Frank. I couldn't have answered it. Sorry. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Okay. Condition number. Okay. It's a vector bundle. It depends on the vector bundle on the fiber bundle. So, so just yeah. I, I mean, but this structure, actually, right this is important. Yeah. Let's, say, let's say we just have one quadratic equation, right? Okay. And, and then we have this hypersurface in Pn. When the quadratic equation drops rank, the quadratic becomes singular. <laughs> The projection onto Pn becomes singular, but you're saying the fiber over. No, that, you, you're no, looking at you're, it's, it's an incidence variety. Incidence varieties are usually smooth fiber bundles. So I see this is de singular. It's an incidence yeah. variety. Yeah. For each second coordinate, it's a linear yeah. space, non-zero linear space. Oh sure, yeah. Okay, I got it. Okay. It's a great trick. Everybody should know that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, I agree. <laughs> it's a great trick. <laughs> okay. So what is condition number? So um, now, very simple. Our input is f, and we have a perturbation of f. Okay. Maybe the data is inaccurate, and I don't know what. Then uh, it will have some impact. Uh, the solution zeta will change somehow, and we have to quantify this. So and this can be quantified by the condition number. So uh, what happens here? So you see here, uh, I wrote it here just uh, as a definition. And, uh, but let me explain a little bit, that's very important. So what is this con condition number? It's just a formula. Um, hmm. Actually, okay, maybe I should explain it. That, uh, so I just, okay, I want to convince you that uh, what we do here is very, very natural. It's very, very natural. <coughs> so this f theta is in the solution variety, and then I project it down to f. Okay. Now, uh, projection. Let's call it pi one. So what we do? We take the derivative. So we have a, a tangent space here. This goes to the tangent space here, which I can identify with this. Okay, this is the derivative. I don't write the argument. 
Okay. If the zeta happens to be a, a simple zero of f, then this is a subjective map. Actually, it's an isomorphism. It's an isomorphism. So I can locally invert it. So I can. So this is an, this. This will be an isomorphism. So I can locally invert this map. So and then I get. This map G, I call the solution map. So this map just takes the input F and gives me a zero zeta. You see, if you have one F, in general, the, you will have many, many zeros. I mean, by Bezu's theorem, you have a Bezu number, which is the product of the degrees, many zeros. So you pick one of those, but locally, you have this smooth dependence. Okay. So how do we define the condition number? So we, right. So we have this g. This is g. What we take, the derivative of g. Okay. So this grows from the tangent space of the input space to the. Okay, it would go to the tangent space of the projective space. Um, it's a linear map. It's a linear map, and then. So okay. Now on these vector spaces here we have uh, we have norms because here on this HD we have chosen the Hermitian inner product so we have a norm here on this space we also have a norm so we can talk about the operator norm of this derivative. Can you okay. switch pens to one that throw that one away and then the one just to the right of this? Okay. Like one more. I'm sorry about. It's okay. We take the operator norm of this linear map, and this is this is the condition. This is the condition number, essentially. Okay. Here one has to, in order to make turn it into scale invariant, we we put this norm of f here, but uh, that's what it is. So you see what I want to stress here that this is a, like a very general framework we are working in, and I explain this framework to you in the setting of polynomial system solving, but it's very, very general. Okay, Mike Schub will this afternoon talk about the problem to compute an eigenvalue eigenvector. The same methodology applies. Okay. Okay, and maybe what 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 is right. So this is the condition number. So if you work this out, this is actually it's an exercise in calculus. So if you know calculus, you can do this exercise and then you will get essentially this formula. So what you get here, the derivative of f, think of f as a map from zn plus 1 to zn, you take the derivative, this is a matrix, it's an n times n plus 1 matrix, then here I decorate it and multiply it with this diagonal matrix, this is just for technical reasons, actually you don't, you don't get this when you do this calculation, it's not important for this, the purpose of the survey talk. Essentially m is this matrix, the derivative of f of zeta, you take the Moore-Penrose inverse, the norm. Then you multiply with this. And why do I have to do this? I want to have a notion that is invariant under scaling. Yeah? If I multiply f by 100, the condition number shouldn't change. So what happens if I multiply f by 100? This matrix is multiplied by 100. Because I have the inverse here, it multiplies by 1 over 100, but because I have this, it compensates. So it's a scale invariant. Uh, excuse so, me, but this works well even uh, if df is a singular uh, uh, matrix? Mm, all of the theory, only, I'm only, I'm focusing on simple zeros. Ah, simple zeros. If, they are, if there are multiple zeros, I can't say anything. Yeah, because but I will do this local averaging. I, I don't see the singular solution. So, okay, think of the everything is smooth. So, okay, so to summarize, this condition number is well defined actually on the projective space of H D times P N. Okay, I have to go on. So, then what we do here? Uh, I, mean, I have to explain the algorithm. Uh, we do a Newton iteration, as everybody does. So everybody knows what is a uh, Newton iteration. Here, the only, the only twist to this problem is that we have this projective space. So you have, there are some choices to do, and I don't want to go into the detail. Believe me, it's quite straightforward to come up 
with the Newton operator n sub f it will be a rational map from Pn to Pn that I can iterate and if I have a starting point x0 then I do this iteration and hopefully it will converge quickly to a zero. Okay, and this hopefully has tur be turned into a theorem by Steve Smith, sometimes uh, called this the gamma theory. Gregorio has talked about it in one of our seminars and even proved it from the FN case. So what is this theorem saying? Well, well, we all know that if the starting point of the Newton iteration is sufficiently close to a simple zero, then we have quadratic convergence. That's what we learn in our classes in numerical analysis. But what does it mean to be sufficiently close? And here is a quantitative statement saying that if your zeta is the zero, x zero is the approximation, if this distance in projective space is less than some constants, forget about the d, essentially less than one over the condition, of the pair f zeta, and then if you start your Newton iteration at the x0, you have immediate convergence with quadratic speed. Okay? The gamma theorem. So, okay, what else do we need? Mm -hmm. Ah, okay, what we say here, we say x0 is approximate 0 of f if this inequality is satisfied. So this uh, maybe explains one of the notions that appeared in the statement of Smale 17. So this has a precise meaning. Okay. So now, then another idea that we are all familiar with, I mean homotopy continuation, that Charles Wampler explained in detail what this is. Uh, so I think I can be quick here. It's a very beautiful idea. Uh, so. You have, a, you have to ha choose a start system, you choose your favorite system consisting of the G and with the zero zeta, so it's an element of the solution variety. It should have nice condition, of course. And then what you do, somebody gives you the input F, and then you connect F and G by a smooth curve. For simplicity, let's assume it's just a straight line segment, it's the simplest one can think of. So I connect those by this line segment and uh, right and then I, let's assume that this line along this line segment here I denote this by the these polynomial decisions by Q index T let's assume that none of this Q T has a multiple zero and then I can continue the zero theta uh, from G to F so under this assumption is none of the Q T has a multiple zero there exists a unique lifting of this map, t go to, goes to qt to a solution path in the solution variety. Okay, so this is, this is actually a well-known topological argument. Okay, so maybe I can make a drawing here that I can reuse later on. Do you think I can remove the pizza information? <laughs> if you take notes, then <laughs> of the important things. Okay. So what I have here, so zero. So, so my my polynomial system G is a vector in H D. So this this board is H sub D, and uh, okay. Here I have f. Okay, and then what did, what did I say? I connect those by a straight line segment. Good. And then I just go from here to here with constant speeds. Let's say here this is q sub t. This is 1 minus t g plus tf. Okay. Now, somehow with this picture, I do emphasize the Euclidean nature of this picture, but on the other hand, I said everything happens in projective space. Projective space is hard to draw, so I draw a, a sphere, or if you want, this is a, a circle. So actually, I can project everything here on the sphere. So on the, the, the length of the vectors actually don't matter. The only thing that matters is where you are on the sphere. So it's a, it's a thing about angle, angles. I go from here to here. Okay, but the, I will explain later why this is important. Okay.
Okay, so then the question is what is the step size? I mean, if you go from here to here, I mean, you will subdivide. Uh, you will, okay, you will have steps of different sizes. Uh, okay, and then one can figure out fo the following algorithm. You have a step size here. Assume you are at QI, you want to go to QI plus 1, and here what, what do I suggest? The step size should be proportional to 1 over the square of the condition number at the approximation you are currently. It's a suggestion, yeah? And I can do it this way. Okay, but just, just keep in mind that this distance here, this is an angular distance, okay? So this, is a, this defines an algorithm, okay? So I, I'm... Okay, I'm okay. I'm a bit dizzy, so this is was lunch. I had too much lunch. So I, if I am, okay, I have this approximation. Okay, and what do I do? I replace QI by QI plus one. Okay, I move on a little bit. And uh, what is the idea? Um, the idea is I should. Okay. I want to have that ci is an approximate zero to qi in this strict sense that, that I defined before in the, in the sense of the gamma theorem. Now what I do is, if I go from qi to qi plus one, I want to make sure that ci is still an approximate zero to qi plus one. So I know that when I want, when I make, want to make this formula, I need to keep track of what happens with the condition if I go from here to here. So, but this can be settled by some Lipschitz property. Okay, so I, if I figure out, if I do it this way, then what I do in order to get the zi plus one, I apply one Newton iteration here, but with regard to the qi plus one. Okay. This is, this is what I wrote here. So this is the basically the definition of this adaptive linear homotopy, adaptive linear homotopy, ALH. Okay, so this is the algorithm, if you want, you can implement it. And the, it's the question is, oh my, time is running. The question is, uh, what is the complexity? What is the complexity of this procedure? Okay, let's denote it this way, K like complexität. <laughs> uh, depends on this triple, so G zeta is the input, pair F is now it's the starting system, F is the input pair, this is the number of Newton continuation steps. Okay, okay then <coughs> basically there was an analysis of this procedure, it implicitly it was already in the Bezu series, but Mike Schub wrote uh, an important paper, Bezu 6, where he essentially proved this. He bounded the number of steps of this homotopy method by this integral. It's the integral of the squared condition number along the curve in HD. So along in this situation, it would be along this line segment. But it's a very general result. So it's a curve integral. So if we want to understand the complexity, we have to deal with this integral. OK. So. Uh, Okay, well, there, there, there are several issues. Okay, it's a long story and it's hard to explain uh, in detail in an hour. So, the, the, huh? What was gamma dot in the last one? Gamma is the, okay, it's the continuation. So, this. It's the solution path, but thanks. Yeah. It's the solution path. The solution path. Oh, there's a, and it's an error. Yeah. There's an error. <laughs> Should be, sorry. It should be QT dot. I'm sorry. Thank you. <laughs> this is an error. Okay. Thank you. Okay. How to choose? The, this looks. Uh, no. Everything is defined except for the question how to choose the start system. And actually, this is the most difficult problem. Yeah. Well, I could prove uh, that almost all elements in the solution variety of, are good in the sense that their condition is bounded by a polynomial in N. But we don't know how to efficiently construct such a start system. It's this problem that we have encountered here during this problem. It's the problem to find hay in haystack. So <laughs> take any one at random, it will be good. Nobody knows how to construct it. So, um, 
Okay, but what do we do if we have this hay in haystack situation? We try randomization. Okay. So, uh, okay. So let me. What does randomization mean? So what we could do, we could say, okay, let's choose G uniformly at random. Where? Well, I said that the, the, the norm of G doesn't play any role. So let's, for instance, choose G in the sphere belonging to HD uniformly at random. Alternatively, we may say, okay, let's think of Gaussian distribution. Let's choose G according to the standard Gaussian distribution. So using this density, okay? So if we, if we have a G that is chosen this way and we normalize it, what we get is, of course, we get the uniform distribution on the sphere. Okay. It has no implication on this algorithm. Okay. So, uh, right. So let me define a distribution on a solution variety okay. in two steps. Just, it's a mind, it's a thought experiment. It's not something that you actually do. First, you choose your G here from the standard Gaussian distribution. And then, almost surely, it will have bizu number many zeros. You choose one of them uniformly at random. Okay. This way you get a pair, G theta, and I call it the standard distribution. Okay. Of course, uh, you can't do this efficiently this way because <laughs> I mean, we are talking about efficiently solving systems of polynomial equations. But you can turn it around. And this was a very nice uh, observation by Carlos Beltran and Luis Miguel Pardo. And they realized one can efficiently sample in the solution variety by kind of turning this around. Okay. And if we have this, um, then okay, we, f we find this using randomization and use this pair then as to start a homotopy. The homotopy. So we get uh, a Las Vegas algorithm, LV. <laughs> so what, in, on input F, we draw the start system at random, and then we run the adaptive linear homotopy. Well, this is an algorithm, a randomized algorithm. Sorry, can you say yes? That, what does it mean? Choose one of the zeros at random? What's the meaning of this? Choose. Uh, yeah. Raise your hand to a bag of zeros. Uh, I mean, it's. Uh, the zeros? Huh? What, what is for you a zero? Okay. I, this is a way of defining a probability distribution. I say choose, but in principle, I define a probability distribution. Uh -huh. Okay. I mean, if I, I have chosen G, standard Gaussian, then I know almost surely I have bezu, ne bezu number many zeros. They exist. Yes. Then pick one of them at random, uniformly at random. Think. I think of it. Okay, you think this defines a probability distribution. Okay. I don't actually do it, it's just to define it. Okay. Good. So, I have, a, I have an algorithm, uh, uses randomization. Now, okay, it's a bit tricky. So, uh, because it uses randomization, I, I want to talk about expected running time. So, what I have here, I have this function, k, f, g, zeta, and I take the expectation over g and zeta. Then, what I get is a function which only depends on f, k, f the complexity of the input f. Okay. So this, uh, and then, again, what uh, Beltrano Pardo proved. Um, okay, let's now take, let's take the average of kf over all f. So this is another, okay, <laughs> this is maybe very confusing, like the g zeta is like <laughs> random coins, something like it helps you in the algorithm, and this is uh, taking an average over the input space. Okay, they proved this beautiful result that the expectation of Kf is bounded by this very small quantity, capital D. I f probably you forgot what is capital D. It's the maximum of the degree <coughs> of the di. I, I, think, I think I forgot to write it. I'm sorry. No, no. You have to distinguish this d, which is the maximum, and this calligraphic d, which is the Bezu number. It's not the same. <laughs> okay. So, so this is a small d. Just, okay, if quadratics, quadratic symbol is just two to the three half times number of coefficients times number of variables. So it's a very small bound. Okay, it's very polynomial. Yeah, 
much, much less. That's the amazing thing. That's yeah. very amazing. But I guess that's because you're just finding one. Do you think it's because you're only looking for one zero? Of course, if you want to find yeah, all of them. Then, then you have to multiply, yes, but if you try to, to find just one zero using Grebner basis. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's you know. <laughs> okay. That's why we use numerics. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. And, uh, okay. 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 Now, what is this boost exactly? I, at least I wanted to state the theorem correctly. So, again, back to this smoothed analysis. Uh, at the beginning of my talk, I just had this drawing, but now it's more formal. So, what do I do? I fix an f bar in HT, and I have a positive number sigma, which is like the standard deviation. Then I look at the isotropic Gaussian on the input space HD with mean f bar and variance sigma square it's, yeah? and the density is this this uh, expression just defines it and then we have this uh, you know, this is the usual notation for denoting this okay and then we have there is a technical issue don't okay don't worry for um, okay for the purpose of the analysis we do truncate this Gaussian so uh, okay, what do we do Okay, so this, this, hmm. the expectation of the norm of f is roughly square root of 2n. So believe me, it's uh, so we truncate there. So I mean, actually, what you, yeah, I don't want to write the density, but you can also truncate at 10 times this, it doesn't really matter. So we want, we, we don't want to have this distribution to have a tail so we just cut it off but, be, but because it goes down exponentially it doesn't make a big difference but it uh, simplifies the analysis so we truncate it but that's a technical issue so I denote this by this index t here and then this is the re result with Felipe the smoothed analysis of these Las Vegas algorithms is this <coughs> so you see we take now we take the local average here over the function kf you can take the supremum over all f bar. So actually, I have to put this condition here that the norm of f bar is one. Other, otherwise, this is not a good model here. So otherwise, I should scale the variance with sigma. That's a, you, the supremum over this local expectation this is bounded by this. You see, it's like in the Beltran Pardo, d to the 3 half, capital N, small n divided by sigma. Where is it sigma square? Sigma. Sigma, OK. So, so that's uh, okay. I think uh, so. I think uh, now you see. Okay, you can think of yourself what the meaning of this is. I mean, it's it's. I think it's a much better result than just having average. You take any system, you perturb it a little bit, then you run the algorithm, then you solve something. Of course, you don't solve the original system. You solve a perturbed system. But you find a solution very quickly. Uh, may I ask a question? Yes, yeah, sure. So I guess it is isotropic Gaussian. That means you are perturbating in every direction. The right. Same. Right. Right. Uh, but you know, for depending on your fixed part, your direction closeness to the discriminant variety could change. One direction could be worse than the other. That's true. Yeah. Uh, is there a way to perturb this a little bit and make it non-isotropic depending on your fixed part? Yeah, it has to do, I mean, this question is related to the following question. When you, I mean, you want to do the homotopy, and when you do the homotopy, you want to avoid the discriminant variety. So, I mean, you, you, can, come, you can come up with all kinds of clever ways of avoiding the discriminant variety, but I don't see a simple way that I could uh, analyze. Somehow. You can come, come up with all kinds of ideas. But I think if you want to do an analysis like we did, you have to come up with something very clean. Otherwise, it's impossible to analyze. I'm just trying to... Clear. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, 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 but you're right. You're right. So some steps are more dangerous than... Some directions are more dangerous than others. Okay. Okay, and then let's go quickly. So what did we do with this near solution to Sumer 17's problem? I think somehow this is probably the cleanest result that we had, but uh, as a... A byproduct of that smoothed analysis was that we could find this deterministic algorithm for Smale 17's problem. And what did we do? Okay. 
So, uh, well, what do we choose as a start system? Yeah, we just choose this system. This is the system here where the roots are these tuples of roots of unity and it was also in the talk by Charles Wampler it seems that people have used that a long time so we just use that and that the problem with this system is that the condition is uh, quite big it's uh, something like n to the d d is the maximum degree so you see if d is 2 it's okay but if the degree is big this is not a nice start system it has a large complexity so that's okay so what we did, okay, we said the following, uh, let's assume the maximal degree is less than n, then we run our adaptive linear homotopy, and if the d is greater than n, so what we do, oh, we switch the world, and we do symbolic methods essentially, so we use methods from computer algebra, so it's... Uh, so there was a, um, an analysis uh, by Jim Renegger, which was used, uh, it was kind of numerical, not just symbolic, we can, sh can just use that, this takes roughly capital D to the n steps, and if you do the, you know, if you do your numerics, then you see that, uh, okay, you get this bound here, so, <clears throat> okay, I can be more precise, for instance, if the maximum degree is less than or equal n to the 1 minus epsilon for some fixed epsilon, then this n to the d, the n to the d is the bad thing here because that's the bound for the, of the condition of the initial system. This n to the d is polynomial bounded in capital N. This is just some you know, dealing with the numbers. And similarly, if the maximal degree is greater than n to the 1 plus epsilon, you can bound now not n to the d but d to the n in, as a polynomial capital N. So this is, doesn't have a deep meaning, it's just how it is. Okay, and it, the, the back case is, is the, the, if capital D equals N, okay, then we just get this. So somehow this is not the right algorithm. You see, the, this homotopy is nice if the degrees are small, but if they are bigger, one should have something else. So I feel it's not the final answer, but it works. <laughs> one can prove the theorem. Okay, so how is my time? 15 minutes. On the proof, okay, I still have... Okay, decide what to explain. Okay, what is the proof? Uh, okay, I want to show you. Okay, I want to show you actually how this works. But okay, for to keep it simple, let's assume we are in the average situation. So actually, I show you how one can prove the Beltran Pardo result this one with, with the idea of Gaussians. Okay. So, uh, okay. so there is a, a main auxiliary result and it's the following. Okay. So we, we have some Q in H sub T okay. and it has a, almost surely it will have bizu number many zeros for each zero zeta, we have this pair Q zeta and it has a condition, okay? And then I take, I have the vector of all these conditions and I take the L2 norm. So this is, I, take, I have here the sum of the squares of these conditions, divide by the Bezu number and take the square root. This I call the mean square condition number, okay? The mean square condition number, <coughs> the main auxiliary result is like the machine in all these things, in these proofs, is the following result. Um, so what do we have here? The, uh, okay, the square of the mean square condition number divided by this, uh, the square norm. This quantity we analyze, we do a, a smoothed analysis of this quantity here, you see. We have a local expectation over Q with any Q bar, sigma square, supremum over over Q bar uh, of norm 1. And we bound this by a constant time uh, n times n over sigma square. Okay. So this is the... Okay, now I have... Okay, I have only 15 minutes left. So I wanted to show you two things. I wanted to show you how to come up with the average analysis using this main auxiliary result. It was one thing. And the other thing I wanted to give you an idea 
how to prove this so probably I just show you the second thing and I leave out the first I cannot probably you're all tired like me but, uh, but let's make it short I, I tell you some of the ideas what is behind this okay the disadvantage is that you won't see why it is so nice to use Gaussians but uh, okay now can we switch off this middle thing <coughs> not to write on the wall So it's, uh, it's about the proof of this main auxiliary result, yeah? So let's recall the solution variety. So it's this incidence variety consisting of these pairs, Q zeta. Q is in my space, H sub D. Okay, now if we write, mm -hmm. okay, for the, for the purpose of the talk actually it doesn't matter. At all. So that's the solution variety. Actually, what should take here the sphere, but it uh, doesn't really matter. So uh, the idea is somehow to reduce to the case which is linear. So there is a special case. There's a special case where all the degrees are linear. All these degrees are one. Okay? That's the case we want to solve a system of linear equations that we believe we all understand. So in, what is in this special situation? What do we have? An input consists of n linear forms. Okay? A linear form is a row of a matrix. Okay? So the, I can encode it as an n by n plus 1 matrix I know that you are all tired I can see that <laughs> uh -huh. okay, let, the calligraphic m is my abbreviation of the space of n times n plus 1 matrices now the solution variety in this special case consists of the pairs m zeta okay, in calligraphic m times c Okay, times En such that M theta equals zero. Okay. okay. Good. And now I look at the following map. As Frank <coughs> noticed, the both these are these are vector bundles. Okay, these are both vector bundles. And now, now I write a bundle map from V to W that I denote Psi. What do I do? Okay, I map Q zeta to M zeta. You see the base point is the same, so it's a, a map of vector bundles. Okay, and now let me define this M. Probably you have forgotten, but uh, this is this quantity that, that arises when, we, when I define the condition number. important thing is this I take Q, okay think of this Q what is Q? Q is Q1 up to Qn and I can think of it as a polynomial map from Cn plus 1 to Cn okay so I can take derivative I can take the derivative of this thing at zeta and this is a matrix uh, in the space calligraphic M and then I decorate it I have to post multiply it with this diagonal matrix which is uh, not so important for us at the moment for the proof very important but for the global rough understanding not so important right and then by definition by definition I know this condition of the pair Q zeta divided by the norm of Q is exactly the the operator norm of this pseudo inverse of 
M. So that was my definition of the condition. Okay, if you remember uh, in the slide it was F instead of Q, but it's the same. The condition of Q zeta is the norm of Q times this norm of this matrix. Okay? So, now, huh. Okay, so, <laughs> so what do we want to understand? For, in order to prove this main technical result, So we, we, what do we have? We have the squared means this square of the mean square condition divided by the square norm, and we need to bound the expectation of this over this uh, non-standard Gaussian. Okay. Okay, now, uh, huh, maybe erase. Erase this, I think. I won't use it. So let me put the diagram here. Okay. Uh, so, if you recall, I defined a distribution on the solution variety. I said, Choose G uniform, uh, G was Gaussian, and then one of the roots uniform at Riemann. Now re replace this. Okay. I can do the same here. If I choose Q, now it's not a standard Gaussian, it's just this non centered Gaussian. And after choosing it, I choose one of the zeros uniform at Riemann. I can do the same. And this way, I define some probability distribution on this solution variety. Okay, it can be quite complicated because it comes from something non-centered. Okay. So then I have this bundle map psi goes from V to W. Okay, now this probability distribution defines a push forward distribution here. So I get here some probability distribution. Just push forward. Okay. Okay, now the first observation is that this, this expectation I want to estimate is the same as the expectation of mu q zeta squared divided by norm of q squared with respect to distribution on v that I defined before. So this because, because what is this? What is this mu two squared? It's just the average over all the of all the squares of the condition. So if you think about it for a moment, if you are not too tired, not too tired, then you realize it's exactly this. Okay. So I have this expectation on v. Now, but you see, this is the square of the operator norm of the pseudo inverse. This only depends okay on the element here okay only on this guy so well, this is the same okay, i just write here this expression and I, so i have to what i have to analyze is the ex, uh, is the expectation of this squares operator norm with respect on the to the push forward distribution on W. I just write W, but I mean the push forward <coughs> distribution, okay? Good. Uh, right, and so next. Uh -huh. Now, the elements of W have two components, M and theta. So I think it's important here to think probabilistically, then after that one has to write down all the formulas. But uh, what I can do is I can. Okay, I can choose. Okay, right. If I, I have this map here, two goes here, next to zeta. So this distribution on W defines here another distribution. Okay. If I would st start here with the Gaussian, 
the standard Gaussian, then I would get, get here the uniform distribution. But in this situation, it's something more complicated. It probably concentrates somewhere, some distribution. Okay. So what I can say is, uh, just again, as a mind experiment, I choose theta according to distribution. And then I choose m in the fiber of this map. So this map has a fiber, which I call w theta. The fiber uh, is a, a vector space consisting of all those matrices m such that m zeta equals 0. So what I want to do, I want to write this as an iterated expectation, expectation exp of expectation. So here the expectation is over zeta in Pn, and then the expectation is over m in the fiber um, of this thing. But one, okay, there are some technicalities that one has to, okay. If you want to justify this, you have, I'm sure you have seen this. Usually when you apply this, then you are in a, in, a, in a situation of a product of two spaces. And then if you want to justify this theoretically, you use Fubini. The problem is here that you don't have a product, but, uh, it's, but you have this, this bundle. So then in this, so... There are some de deformations taking place here that you can take into account by using the co-area formula. So the co-area formula is one of the main tools. This is like, a, it's like the transformation formula of calculus where you don't have isomorphisms but things that have kernels. So it's, a, it's also generalized as Fubini. So this, this you need if you want to make this formula. But this, the idea is just this. Okay. And then, uh, right, we have to, okay, then one have to, has to prove some lemma. Because what I want to do now, I want to bound this guy. So I fix the zeta, and I want to bound this, okay? And the goal is I want to bound it. I want to bound this expectation by some constant. And this constant does not depend on zeta times n over sigma square. If I can do that, Okay, then it doesn't matter that I don't understand too well what kind is this distribution of Pn. I can just bound this by the same constant times n sigma square. Okay, that's the idea. So on the, in order to prove, I mean, this red thing here. So if I want to prove that, I need to understand what is the distribution on this fiber. Maybe write, let me write this and then I stop. Uh, used distribution on the fiber W zeta has the density okay, so Right, and then I explain it. As a density of this form, and this row here, this is a, a non centered Gaussian on. W zeta. W zeta is a vector space. So this Gaussian is somehow induced from, from this Q bar here. I started with a non-centered Gaussian which has a center Q bar and this somehow defines this but I don't have time to explain it. But it's a Gaussian, it's a friendly distribution. Okay, something we like. And then it turns out that it gets multiplied with the squared determinant of this. Oh. I shouldn't have written M. Probably I sh should write M. Sorry. I should write M, M. Dot. I should write it this way, I think, because it's not a square matrix. Okay, I should write it this way. And this uh, comes from the, this co-area formula, some normal Jacobian thing. So, okay. So this is one has to prove. And then, once we are here, then if you look at this, then proving this inequality which I have in this red circle, uh, boils down to some 
smoothed analysis of a matrix condition number if you want. So we are in a situation where we just have matrices and uh, okay. so that's uh, this of course one has to prove as well and this is the idea of proving this main technical lemma and I'm over time and thank you for your attention.